Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to a talk on workflow in Jenkins. My name is Jesse Glick. I work for CloudBees. And together with Kosuke, we've been working on this project that you mentioned in the keynote for a few months um, to try to create a more advanced way to put together job flows in Jenkins. So I'd like to talk in more detail about how that works and show you how you can start playing with it today. So what this grew out of was that people were trying to do a bunch of different kinds of complex tasks in Jenkins. So sort of originally Jenkins projects were, fair, were considered to be fairly simple standalone jobs. So you know, there's one, one workspace where everything, where all of your commands run. There's one version control system that, that is associated with the job. There's a single list of steps that run in a single sequence. And if you get a failure in one of those steps, then things stop at that point. And it runs through to the end and publishes some results. And then there are a bunch of plugins that help you run different kinds of steps and help you publish things differently and, and all of this. Um, but there were some more complex things that some people were trying to do that didn't fit very well into this mold and that were a little bit harder to put together. So, so, so one of the critical things was that people wanted to do some, th some kind of continuous deployment where things would run in stages. So they'd have a basic build job that would run, and then there would be some sort of heavier duty tests that would run in the next stage using the output from the first stage. And then perhaps they would be doing, they, they might be forking off some further tests to run in parallel using an application deployed to a test server. And then there might be a, a final human, you know, human approval step near the end where somebody says, yes, this, you know, I don't see anything obviously wrong with this. And yes, you can finally go on to deploy this into production. Um, so that's a pretty central use case for something like Jenkins. Um, and there are a lot of different variations variations on this and different kinds of complex things that you might want to do. So you might want to you know, have a, a blue-green deployment where you want to have, um, you might want to run a bunch of tests and then only switch over your server to a particular version of the software, assuming that everything up to that point passed, and otherwise you want to roll back. Um, people want to run tests in parallel on different computers. People want, want to you know, maybe run different versions of the same repository according to different branches automatically. So there are a lot of, a lot of um, different kinds of basic structures of the job that that could differ quite a bit from the standard Jenkins model. Um, and in the scalability summit, this kind of thing came up a lot, that people were doing these rather complex sequences of steps on different machines in different orders, sometimes spanning several days in, in some cases. Um, and then so all of this kind of stuff was difficult to do in Jenkins. Right. So, so to me, the, uh, one of the things that the important here is this sort of like a context to the workflow. You know, when we talk about the temporary server, there is this temporary server we started that needs to run for the duration of certain part of the workflow. And that kind of thing is, is uh, difficult to capture. So many of the use cases, I think, touch is uh, So just a quick list of things that we need to, if you want to orchestrate a bunch of build steps into one complex flow, so it has a few different characteristics that we saw coming up in different situations. First of all, that it would just be complex. You would have different stages of things that you need to break up your flow into. Um, some, sometimes people needed things needed to do things in a loop or fork, you know, sort of fork the execution and run some things in parallel, that sort of thing. Um, one very important aspect is long running builds. So people, I, I think this is mentioned in the keynote that people really often have things that are running for hours or days at a time, and they want to make sure that whole thing stays running, even if Jenkins itself has to be upgraded in the middle. 
or crashes in the middle or whatever happens, you want to keep everything, you want to keep your work running. Um, interactions with humans means that uh, sometimes people have to submit a new file halfway through a flow or they need to sign off on something to make sure that it really looks okay. So we'll be demonstrating that today. Um, restartable builds. So this means that you want to be able to resume workflow partway through something that, that perhaps took a long time. So the earlier steps might have taken hours or days and you, want, you don't want to duplicate the work that you've already done. And we want to be able to have sort of all of the definition of what goes on in the flow in one pretty simple place and, and make it easy to edit and, and see what's happening at once. So the problem with, with how things were set up in Jenkins using traditional jobs is that there were a bunch of plugins that let you modify the Jenkins control flow, and they work really well if you have a couple of jobs and you're tying them together. So there's a copy artifacts plugin that lets you copy artifacts from an upstream job into a downstream job. Works fine. There's um, a parameterized trigger plugin lets you start the downstream build from the upstream build and pass it a few parameters. And if that's, if that's the whole extent of your flow, then, then there's no problem. The problems come when you try to put together a bunch of these plugins and you have more than two or three jobs and you have 10 jobs and you have all of these different definitions all over the place. It's hard to keep track of all of the variables involved, all of the files involved. So we wanted something that was more consolidated than this. Uh, there was a build flow plugin which we, which we used as inspiration for our work. So this was... Um, a plugin that let you write a script that orchestrated several standard Jenkins jobs and ran them in different kinds of sequences and passed parameters between them and things like that. So it did have some of the, the basic qualities that we wanted. You could, you could script it in different ways. You could extend it with new functions. Um, and it sort of brought together at least the high-level logic of the flow in one place. Um, it did not have the ability to restart... Uh, survive a restart of Jenkins. So that was, that was sort of a key problem with it. And we, we thought about it for a long time and didn't see a way that it could be modified to do that. So, it, so we decided that we needed to do something that took some inspiration from that, but, um, but was actually built the way we needed it to be. Right. But, but uh, I think the beautiful plugin really gave us the confidence in the approach, the general approach that we are mm -hmm. taking. Because uh, we saw that this is a very popular plugin. And then the, so the general idea seems sound. There's just, we got these few things that we want to fix, except that the two fix that we need to kind of have to redo everything <laughs> from scratch. But that's, <laughs> yeah, the, what, what matters is what's the end result, right? right. So I think that's, that sort of gave us a lot of confidence. All right. So this, this is just a little brief preview of what a script might look like in a workflow. We'll show a somewhat more complicated script during the demo, but you can... Um, just briefly see that we're explicitly asking for a particular slave machine to run um, to run various build steps on, and this gets you a workspace on that slave. Um, you're asking for some SCM integrations. You're asking for um, a Git repository, repository to be checked out. And then we can run various build steps, so you're, you know, sort of the, the basics of your actual build, um, archive some artifacts, and then this this part here is stage test is interesting. So what this says is that now we're moving into a new stage of the flow right in the middle of this function, really. And this is going to be marked in the user interface, and it can have other effects as well. Um, if you want to run things in parallel, that's just pretty easy and groovy, so any kind of groovy control constructs that you want to run, loops and things you can put in here. Um, we have human input is integrated into this. This is just a simple OK cancel type prompt. But you can have it ask for detailed information too. And then we say all of the stuff up to this point ran, um, could run in parallel for different 
git commits. But at this point, we want to say concurrency one, only one build can be deploying at once. And so in order to do this using standard Jenkins jobs, you'd have to actually split everything into two job definitions and then use some triggers and some other tricks to, to make sure that it, that it all funnels down to a single build being deployed at once. You don't want to have different people's work being deployed simultaneously. So the, the basic features that you can see here is everything is, is in a single groovy script in this case. So you can see the whole logic of the flow at once. You can see loops, try finally blocks, all of this stuff. You can restart Jenkins. Yeah, so yes, I, I, I can't stress this point enough that I think the part of the simplicity is that all these complex control flow constructs, you know, as you need to orchestrate activities, you need to do you know, the conditional thing or the loop or the parallel execution. All these constructs are you know, written in the familiar paradigm that is the, you know, the Java equivalent Groovy language. So you don't have to learn different ways of doing it. Like there's a no, it's a single language that does it all designed to do that as opposed to a hodgepodge of plugin that they have to put together for different yeah. purposes. So I think this, if anything, I think this is the key mm -hmm. functionality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so they talked about, uh, talked about different stages of execution and input and, and that sort of thing. So in terms of the project setup, um, this whole workflow is, is a single job. So sort of from the outside, it looks a lot like a, like a single freestyle project or something in Jenkins. Um, it's just a job that you can run builds of. Um, all of the, and that, that includes build triggers and parameters. So you can start this job the same way you could any other kind of job in Jenkins on a schedule when, when commits come in from version control and so on. Um, and what's, what's interesting is that you can have um, graphical visualizations of how the build runs. We don't, we don't think it's reasonable to offer a visualization of the job definition because this could be any kind of programming construct. So it could, you know, could use all kinds of loops and things like, and conditional statements and things like that. But for a particular build, you can see how it runs. Um, so the key magic, the, the stuff that, um, that we couldn't see any way to put into the build flow plugin without rewriting it from scratch, which is in a way what we did, um, is to allow you to restart the build after Jenkins restarts or to start up in a known place. So this is, this is basically Kosuke's work here. So this is... Um, the, the technical way this is done is that your Groovy program is transformed into um, an alternate representation that sort of keeps track of everything that's happening in the program, all of your loops, all of your local variables. Um, Jenkins remembers what's happening at every point through your flow. And if Jenkins crashes or is restarted for a plugin update or whatever happens, it still knows what was going on, and as soon as it's able to resume your workflow, it just picks up exactly where it left off. Is any one of you here from like some comp sci background? <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> you know, this is one of the few things you learn in the school, but you never get the implement. Yeah, this, so. yeah, this is the only <laughs> time it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it actually works. It actually works. Yeah. Is the source code available? Yes. yes. It's all open source. Yes. And from a user perspective, you don't necessarily need to know, you know what the, how this is implemented, but basically it should just work that after you restart, things come back up. Um, and one detail of these is that um, if the, the steps that, that run shell scripts or that run some sort of external process, ant, maven, whatever you want, um, those also keep on running even if Jenkins stops, or even if you lose a connection to the slave agent, um, your actual you know, make command or whatever it is you're doing will still keep on running on the machine, and Jenkins will just reconnect to it as soon as it's able to. Um, and then as, as a feature that currently we're 
scheduling to add to um, Jenkins Enterprise is that in addition to being able to have the flow survive a restart of Jenkins, that you can also have it resume from a particular checkpoint. Um, so you can declare checkpoints in your code that, that say this is a safe point, that I've done a whole bunch of valuable work that I don't want thrown away. And then after, if, if something goes haywire after this point, I can just restart from this point and, and save a lot of time. Uh, so the stages, these are, these are things that come up a lot in continuous deployment type situations, and it bears explaining here. So basically, if you have a, a first build that gets kicked off, um, and it's going to go through and... I, I, I think actually sure. the first thing, the high order of it, the, the, the first thing here is that the, you should mentally picture like three stage pipeline. The first you do the build. So close to the mic. Uh, sorry. The, the, yeah, so you should mentally picture this like a three stage pipeline. The first we do the build. And if that works, we want to do the test. And if that works, you want to do the deployment. So that's the basic setup. But the, I think what Jesse is going to explain is in the presence of lots of these things going on in parallel, it actually creates this interesting problem. So, so there you go. Jesse, that. Right. So, so we can run builds of different versions of the software in parallel. It's no problem. Each one gets its own computer to run on and its own copy of the, copy of the source control, and it runs the build. That's fine. And let's say that you can also run your you know, UI-driven tests or something like that in parallel for a bunch of different builds. So that's pretty reasonable. Each one you know, run, starts its own browser, connects to its own test server. That's fine. But, but often there is a particular stage like deployment that you really want to, um, you really want to make single-threaded. So only one version of the software is actually going through the last stages at, at a given time. And you want to make sure that whatever that is, it's something that, that actually went through all of the previous tests. So, so that's a little tricky to set up um, with freestyle projects and chaining them together because you have to do some special things to make sure that you're testing the right version of it. So what in workflow we, we have is, um, is an operator that defines the boundaries between these different stages. And for the deployment stage, you just all you have to do is say, I only want one build running through deployment at once. And if, um, if the second build comes along, it gets ready to go into the deployment stage, but the first build is still running. That's just going to sit there and wait. And then the third build comes along shortly afterwards, and a little bit after that, it also gets to the point where it could be deploying. But it's also going, also going to sit there and wait because the first build is still deploying. At this point, the second build is just going to stop because it knows that the third build is more likely to be what you're actually going to deploy next. So there's no point in even waiting for the second build. So it just stops right here. And then eventually, fourth build comes along. It's waiting. Eventually, the first build is done. And then this is freed up. And so the third build immediately starts deploying. And, and so then you have some other stages here, this fourth build. Um, gets canceled by the sixth build, which is, which is waiting after it. This is a build that failed during the build step, so it never even got that far. So you can set up these complicated stages pretty easily. And uh, we affectionately call this, this seems like some kind of strange parallel, like a synchronization primitive. So we affectionately call it James Node Operator for the in honor of the guy who came up with this thing. He made the whole I want like a whole talk out of this feature the <laughs> Jenkins user in conference in California. So yeah. this is the uh, James Node operator. All right, so let's switch to a demo where we can see all of this stuff together. Uh, yes, my screen resize. That's good. So here I have Jenkins running, and I've um, I have a workflow pre-built here. If you want to make a new one, then you just select workflow from the menu. Um, but here I'll go to this one, and we can see that it just has, looks like a project with some builds and some artifacts and changes and all of the usual stuff that you'd see in a Jenkins job. Um, 
if you click on one of the builds, then you'll see that it looks pretty different. Um, sorry, Kosuke, this is supposed to be a terminal icon. It got broken at the last minute. Um, so unlike a regular build, this, this build has structure. So you can see that it, it actually has a bunch of different steps that here we're capturing in a, in a table view. Um, you can also let me see if I get this right. Graph is, is a temporary feature. We have we have something that can show you a, a an actual graph of what happened in which order. This is just sort of a placeholder. We'll try to have something you know, something nicer and more more specific to workflow in the future. That's relative. Yep. Right. So this is not based on the definition, the script. This is what actually ran on this particular build of the flow. So from build to build, you might be running different kinds of stuff. So a particular build, you know, it might be checking whether a particular, you know, if Google.com is down, then it runs some totally different flow, whatever. So if you look at the the definition of this. So all of the all of the meat is sort of contained in this one script. And yes, this isn't pretty yet, so we haven't quite gotten the uh, the code coloring integration working and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. I'll get to that. Yeah. That's coming, it, we don't have that quite yet, but so right now it's, um, the script is hard coded as part of the job, but in the future, absolutely, we'd like to have this, have it be possible to keep this as part of your project sources too. You have to Sure, you can say any slave. Um, this is just a label definition. Whoops. Yeah. Sorry. I guess that doesn't something, work in this case. Yeah. Something wrong is happening. No, I guess you can't use the, the pointer on this. Um, well, okay, okay. Let's yeah. pop this out and seem to have some problems with the pointer. Yeah, when you when you ask for a particular node like this. This is just a slave label, so this could just be asking for any particular class of slaves, or you can just emit this, and it will grab any kind of slave available. Um, so here we're just uh, checking some sources out from Git. We're running some Maven builds. We're archiving the result of the Maven builds. And then we're switching into a new stage that we're calling QA. And by the way, some of the syntax here is sort of in a transition phase, we'll be trying to make the, the syntax prettier in the coming months. Um, so here we're running some things in parallel. So um, we're starting up two different branches of code, and each one is going to call this function, run with server. So you can see that I can define logic within, um, by defining functions, you can. This is Groovy, so you can use Java syntax, or you can just use a sort of simplified Groovy syntax like this for defining functions. Um, so here's a function with an argument. The argument is actually a closure or another block of code that we can run. Um, so here, this is just a really, really simple version of deploying to a temporary server. So what I have here is just a a Jetty server up and running that's waiting for you to drop some WAR files into it. Yeah. And, yeah. and if I may intercept here, so part of, as you can see, you can mix and match arbitrary, you know, the regular Java code. That UUID.random UUID mm -hmm. stuff is a regular JRE, you know, Java library, nothing yeah. to do with workflow, so you could mix that. And also, part of the intent is, you know, in this first version, we are putting everything into single text box. But you see that up there, the uh, CPS flow definition setting is actually a drop down. So this is another extension point. So the way we anticipate to allow people to put this in version control is one, 
to do that by you know, providing alternate sources to read script from. And then also in Groovy, there are ways to just evaluate arbitrary Groovy file into the current program. So we could, you, know, like you could just evaluate into the script from your source tree if you want to. Um, or say you want to define some of these subroutines, then share them across projects, right? So we, we, anticipate, so we expect that we'll be able to provide you this common place to define these reusable functions and classes, the workflow mm -hmm. primitives, and then just call into these guys from you know, this, the, uh, this individual job setting, minimizing the overlap. So that's all the kind of things that we can do relatively easily. Mm -hmm. he, he wants. Do, you, uh, do you expect that you'd be able to parameterize this, this, uh, this script as well? For yep. Oh, yeah, sure. Yep. Yeah, so you can just, you, it can just be parameterized like any Jenkins job. Oh, that, does that work? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it should. <laughs> And currently, those are just accessed as they just show up as Groovy variables. But that's that's probably going to be revised somehow. So we'll we haven't spent too much time on that yet. But we'll do something similar to that. Um, so so what's interesting here is that so you see that I've defined a little helper function to deploy a WAR file to Jetty here. Um, just to keep it simple. It's just copying the file into a deployment directory. Um, and then I have a body that actually runs tests. It's passing in the URL of the temporary application that can compute really easily here. And then I'm just using a regular try finally block. So I didn't need any special plugin or any or anything to take care of cleaning up my temporary server after I'm done. I just use a try finally block. If this body fails, no problem. It still gets cleaned up. So it's so it's a lot more just like running. Just like writing a regular, a simple program that you can fully control the behavior of. And e even if you restart Jenkins in the middle, that's the real magic of R. Yes. <laughs> um, and then we're we're going to check for check for user confirmation. Well, first we're going to deploy to a staging server, and then we're going to check for user confirmation. And then we hit a checkpoint. So we've already done all of our functional tests and gotten confirmation that something looks good. We're going to have a final checkpoint before we deploy to production in case something after this point fails. So here I'm just checking that the, that the server is live to deploy to. And then I'm actually running a deployment step. So let's see what it looks like when you, when you go and build this. Yeah, I can leave it. So if you build now, um, so you can go over to the Jenkins overview page. You can see that there's um, there's actually two things being shown. There's the general workflow itself, CD number seven. Um, this is just the logic of the workflow. And then there's a separate annotation for um, the jobs are actually running on a particular executor. So this might be on, a, on some slave, or you might have several of these going on at once because your workflow might have gathered together several slaves and done some different things on each of them in parallel. If we go to the console output, you can see that it's it's just running some stuff. It'll look pretty similar to a freestyle project, except that you can see that right now we're we're showing the steps from the workflow that are being run at each stage. Um, and here, if I restart Jenkins in the middle of this, sure, so we'll just let it go, and this will take a moment to restart. But once it comes back up, you should see it sort of doing whatever it was doing before without us really noticing anything different. Um, in the meantime, all right, it's already done both of our functional tests, which had sort of random, randomized URLs to different applications. It's already deployed our little test application to staging. So hello, Jenkins. So it's up there. Now it's come back up. And so we're still running this build. And at this point, it's paused for input. Um, we'll, we'll be making the UI of this a little bit nicer, but right now it's, it's just sort of a basic prompt here. Um, so the flow is just waiting for you to say yes or no, should I go ahead? And this could also be asking for information. So it be, could be asking you for a password or something like that if it wanted to. 
Um, so this is asking for confirmation before it proceeds to production. Right now, I'm actually going to break it. And I'm going to do that by coming into here. And I'm going to kill my Jetty server. Silly hopper. OK. And then I'm going to proceed. And this is going to fail, or it should fail. Because at the last moment, right before it was about to go to production, it tried to make sure a production server was actually ready to accept the deployment. And no, it wasn't. It was down for some reason. So that's no good. So we want to restart the Jetty server. So that was just a transient outage. OK, so Jetty is back up now. And we want to go, and this failed, but there is a list of checkpoints. And here I had saved a checkpoint called before production. And I just want to restart from it. So, so now it started build number eight. You can see that it's it sort of copied the, the state from build number seven, but it hasn't actually run any of that stuff again. So it's it started up from where the checkpoint statement was, and now it's only redoing the production state the liveness check in the production server, which passed this time. And so then it actually went ahead and deployed to production. So the production app is now live. Is, is there an indication that build 8 was resumed using build 7's session or checkpoint? Uh, checkpoint? Yeah, so internally we keep all the records, but I don't yeah. think we spend enough time to yeah, expose this. Yeah, yeah I think we, we forgot to just add yeah. the, the I mean, marker to the build, but definitely we should do that. Yeah. I mean, to me, those are like a trivial part. Getting the real thing work is the harder part. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yes, yeah, so I guess, yeah, so yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yep. You do. So, this is, as I said, this is supposed to be a terminal icon here. So, if you click on, say, the shell script terminal, then you just get the section of the flow that corresponded to that single statement. You can look at it in isolation. So it's not so useful in this case, but if, you, but if you're running the parallel flows, you know, then you don't, you don't want to see the output intermixed from all of your different test jobs. So you can look at just the, the output from one branch at a time. I don't know if there is any. In this case, there's not. Well, I guess, we, yeah, from the from the build number seven that was actually running this stuff, then you would see the, the test output from one branch in isolation. The structure of the thing is derived from the ASD of the, of the script? No, no. The structure is derived from what actually oh, ran yeah. this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, ASD comp size token. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, and I could, I could demonstrate that, that you can get Changes from get by, but I think you can just trust me on this point. So if I change, if I check in changes um, to the Git repository, then it will automatically pick them up. You can set up commit triggers and so on. So that works much like a freestyle project. Um, the difference, though, is that there's no there's no um, Git configuration here in the project definition. It's all completely automatic from the fact that you ran this Git step, and so whatever. SCM you actually checked out, that's what it will show you change logs for and, and do polling on and things like that. Yep. So you had mentioned you know, uh, business uh, approval to deploy the production. Mm -hmm. Is there any concept of like uh, role strategy integration for mm -hmm. who can perform that yes. kind of step and how they get notified that you know, they need to perform that? Yeah, so we have a. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, this is a great question because we just happen to have a product called Jenkins Enterprise at Kravis, which offers these functionalities called the role-based access control. So yes, we do. And I didn't ask you to ask this question, by the way. <laughs> this is not a product placement. <laughs> but just in generally, the input step can you can give it a, a particular user or any kind of um, any kind of groups that that user is part of. So it could be LDAP groups or something like that. Yeah. Uh, this yeah. Um, no, but we could add that. 
Uh, yeah, it's one of these trivial things to add, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, somebody, yeah, somebody it's, could write yeah, it. It's you extensive know. also, you can write one. Yeah. yeah, somebody could pretty easily write that step. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a question on mm -hmm. uh, the Um, it wouldn't, yeah, it, it, that's probably just a bug in those plugins, but um, we do require some changes to the SCM plugin or, in order to work with this because the model is different enough that we couldn't just make it work right out of the box. Um, right now we've done, done the required changes for Git, Subversion, Mercurial, just as starting points. Um, but we, we'd hope to see see the other big ones, AccuRev and Perforce and so on, be added to that list too. Uh, so I think we can go back to... Except you removed it, so... Oh, yeah, and, yes, that's not good. <laughs> Here, I can press page down, that's not yeah. too big. <laughs> uh, so the basic... The basic design here is that it's actually built as a bunch of plugins. It's not a single plugin, um, and we did it that way to make you know to try to make it as modular as possible, so you can add in certain um, certain features in a nice, extensible way if you want to. Um, one of the things that's pluggable is the way that the workflow is defined and run, and so we've just been showing the the Groovy-based engine, and we think that's what people will want to use in most cases. Um, but we've left in the possibility to have workflows be defined using some sort of graphical flow editor if people are used, are used to BPMN or things like that. Then, in principle, that should be possible to do as well. So, yep. Yeah, so, um, yes, so one, one does wonder indeed, and there is actually a prior art in this space that there someone from Cisco tried to integrate the BPMN engine, complete with ID support that lets you drag and drop workflow and so on and so forth. And then the, what we discovered is that it didn't, it didn't get the kind of adoption that we thought it did. And then we talked to the author, the guy who did it, and he thinks actually the people do seem to prefer the text-based approach. So, you know, and then we also saw the success of the build flow plugin, the job DSL plugin. There's a number of other plugins in Jenkins that's used in production today by different people that all uses the textual representation. So I'm sort of like withdrawing my judgment on this issue, this issue and simply pointing out that if you just look at what seems to be successful, this is what seems to be going on. But I am not arguing about the definition. I'm yeah. arguing about the visualization. Oh. Mm -hmm. Uh, for for a lot of cases, it's probably possible. It would be somebody's PhD to make it, you know, <laughs> work really reliably. I think, um, but there's, yeah, that's something somebody could build. I think to, with some limitations. I mean, there's just going to be some control flows that are too weird to be captured graphically because because of the nature of it. But for for I think for the the common cases that people would run into, that's probably feasible. But. We're not we're not working on that at the moment, but that's something that could be added. So. Um. So let's see. So. Yeah, I guess, so we haven't thought about all the implications of updating various plugins during the restart. Um, but um, if, if, you, if the stuff that you happen to be running when you're doing the restart is affected by the like a plugin upgrade, I could, I could, I suppose, some, some 
pretty strange I things think. that happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. But I think that most of the time, the where that stuff takes time is actually the process that we are forked off as a powder build, mm -hmm. and so that's not really in any plugin. So I I, I expect in, real, in you know realistically the impact to be very minor. So maybe that's yeah, I, that might be a more general right. issue. I'm not. I'm not sure that would be particularly different under workflow. So. Oh, sure. I guess so we should probably repeat the question. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So the question was about running other kinds of things like ant build steps or things like that. So any kind of other process, build process that you want to run as part of your flow, that would all just be wrapped in a single maybe shell build step or Windows batch command or something like that. Um, and there will probably be more plugins that make it easier to run those, those steps. So those, that could all be reused. So what you would write in the workflow itself would be higher level stuff that's very specific to Jenkins, not your software so much. So things about allocating Jenkins slaves, about publishing results to Jenkins, that sort of thing. Uh, I'll actually get to that if I can... Um, uh, don't have too much time to go th to go over this, but we'll get to that. Um, there's a, a general system for representing the state of the workflow. So we so we talked a bit about this about um, the representation of the execution and how you can have visualization for different parts of it. Um, and there are different kinds of steps that are available. So we saw a git checkout step and we saw some shell steps being used that, um, that do sort of single tasks. Um, but there, it's also possible to have block structured steps that, that, um, that take something inside, um, inside braces. And so the actual things like allocating a node like this with node master, this is just written as a regular step pretty much. Um, and so th those are extensible, and people can add new steps of that kind, which we expect will be pretty important. So in terms of interoperability with existing stuff, which was your question, um, right now we don't have integration for existing plugins that add build steps, but that's pretty much next on our to-do list. I think that would be coming up ideally in the next month or so. We'd, we'd be working on that. Um, so that requires some changes in Jenkins core, we think, to make that work. And obviously, there are tons of build steps that are written by all sorts of people out there, so you want to make them all work yeah. in the context of work. So. Right. so there's a lot of plugins that do that, so that's a major point of integration that we want to work on. Uh, to specify a particular space to work in? Uh, to specify the location of the actual Ruby script that you're using to manage the workflow. Uh, uh, right. Um, so that's something that we would, I think that was mentioned before, and that's something we would like to add. Right now we don't have that implemented, but that would definitely be a, um, a pretty important feature to have. So to, to be able to load code from different locations. So. Uh, so there's there's still some stuff missing, as you saw. I mean, this is a pretty early demo. I, this is the first time it's been publicly demoed, really. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff that still needs to be polished up, but I think it's it's in a more or less workable condition today. So this is a workflow plugin on GitHub, and uh, I, we have published binaries that are available in the Experimental Update Center. So if you're running 
the latest Jenkins weekly release or later, you can actually install these and play with it. Um, so we would like to move forward with this progress. And uh, a lot of this stuff is things that people can play with and add plugins integrating with. And if you have pull requests to fix little problems, by all means, bring them in. Uh, so the question was, uh, can you automatically restart from a failure? And there's actually uh, the separate primitive called retry that automatically does it. So if you like a retry step would take a block closure, and if anything in the between fails, it would retry that up to n times you specify. So yeah. Yeah, so that's actually something we, we haven't thought about in too much detail yet. Uh, I think we would like to, yeah. Uh, sorry, so the, the question was about testing or debugging workflows, um, especially complex ones that are running on a production system, and how would you, how would you check for problems in the flow logic? Um, that's something. How do you iterate on them? How do you iterate on them? Um, so if you just... Well, if you just change the workflow definition and rerun a build, then you can you can check whether the new definition works the way you expect it to. But as as far as more sophisticated tools like things like debuggers, we we don't have that yet. But it's something that that would be an interesting feature. Sounds like we should be talking after all. <laughs> I am not quite mentally picturing uh, what you're suggesting. But I guess to repeat right. the question, I guess you, you yeah. system have some ideas about the how to. Fail, the build fails. You don't necessarily want to go through the testing to see. You may want to post that build for someone else to be able to pick up. Mm -hmm. So the logic would be go to the next stage of testing, would be go to post our path. Yeah, well. Um. Yeah, I think I think it's something that could be defined in a in a flow definition. I, but no. I think he's trying to tell us we are running out yeah, of time. Yeah, I'm afraid we're out of time. So, thank you everyone for coming. And <laughs>